Great. Okay. All right. Take two. Um, I want to welcome everybody that's here in the room, as well as those who are tuning in via the live stream that we have going. This is the fourth session of our speaker series on the complexity of pandemics. My name is Sarah Hersey, and I joined the WHO Pandemic Hub in January of this year as the Director of Collaborative Intelligence. I'll be your guide throughout this evening. While all of our speaker series have been special so far, today is a particularly special one. This is the first event that we're hosting in our now furnished um, offices here at the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence here in Berlin. Today, we're going to be focusing on the concept of data preparedness. We're going to be exploring questions that are very close to the core of what the Pandemic Hub does. How can we attain real-time, high-quality data to detect future public health risks and provide intelligence for an effective response? How do we develop our institutions and our workforces to be able to achieve our objectives? What technologies can help us in these efforts? And what is the role of collaboration throughout all of this work? We have experts here from public health agencies in three different countries that are going to be helping us to tackle these challenging questions this evening. First, we're going to hear presentations from them on their unique country experiences. And then we'll have the opportunity to post questions to them on a panel. As always, we would like both our on-site and our online audiences to get involved in this discussion. We have access to a question and answer platform, and this has been shared with you. Um, our registered online guests have received it via email. For those in the audience in the room, you have a, a QR code that is attached to the flyer, and on that QR, QR code, code, you will be able to scan later to ask your questions online. And then many of these questions will be answered via the panel. I'd like to hand over now to Dr. Chikwe Ikakwazu, <laughs> who leads the WHO Pandemic Hub, to say some welcoming words. I'm very much looking forward to a lively and inspiring event. Thanks, Sarah. We'll keep working on that Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> No, anyway, no, really, thanks, colleagues, and really welcome to this uh, evening. It really gives me a, a lot of pleasure to welcome you. Um, I just sent Dr. Tedros a message that we are having our first live event here, and he is really proud of, of the progress made. So thank you so much for sharing uh, this evening with us. It's been maybe just over... A year we moved into this building, um, so it sounds like quite a long time, but it was nowhere close to where it is right now. We moved in without any furniture. In fact, we transported some tables from our old building in, in Geneva over Christmas of 2021. Yeah, and it arrived sometime early in January, and we all sat on the third floor together, huddled. And sometimes, you know, I have a pretty loud voice. <laughs> and when I'm on those Zoom calls, not knowing when my voice is going a little bit <laughs> too loud, my colleagues will look up and tell me, <laughs> tone it down a bit. Um, so, but, so it's really good that we have a space now to host uh, colleagues. But in addition to the space, it's, we've also started work um, on an exciting set of products, projects. And those of you that spent some time with us earlier would have walked around the floors and hopefully engaged with the colleagues working on these different projects, trying to define, help us define the future with yourselves. And really happy to have a few guests as well. Uh, this evening, have a whole team from Africa CDC, five of them. Um, thank you for coming. It's a real personal honor for me that you guys are here visiting RKI, but also uh, coming to the hub as well. And in addition, we're just over the next couple of days having a meeting on the data preparedness. And we have colleagues from public health agencies in the UK, U from the UK, US, Zambia, Fiji, Korea, Canada, Germany, of course, Brazil. So as much as this hub is a hub in Berlin, it really is a hub for the world. 
And that's really the culture I think we're trying to offer that, yes, we have a physical space here, but we hope that this will provide a space for all of us to gather, to think together, to work together, to build relationships that will take us long into the future. And I'm really grateful that we're co-hosting this uh, with uh, the Charité and really happy to have Beate uh, here. Uh, you hopefully get to know her a little bit better over the evening. She'll just come back from, I'm not sure whether it's London or Gambia or everywhere in between, but to start an interesting uh, institute here in the, in the Charité working on global health. So really happy to be co-hosting this with the Charité and we'll be doing more of that. But, um, you know, today is, is really important personally because when we... Um, when we set up, oops, when we opened this uh, building um, in September 2021 and we, we took this picture at the opening ceremony, you would see a wall and of course that was, we needed to cut a ribbon. So we set up a, a, an artificial wall, I got the chancellor and the DG to, to cut a symbolical ribbon to start the hub because we didn't even have this building at the time. So it's been quite a journey to move from this stage uh, to where we are today. And I say that because this would only be possible, the fact that we're here um, from the very general support of the, the German government uh, and just believing, taking a decision. This decision to start this hub was made in May um, 2020, right? So very early, um, very early in the pandemic, May 2021, I think, yes, and then inaugurated a few months later. But anyway, it was made very early in the pandemic uh, between WHO and, and, and the German government, really recognizing, listen, that we're going through this pandemic together, we're facing a risk together, and we're going to do something about it. And one of the things that we're going to do is set up this hub to deal with, to start thinking about how to work on one problem. Without, and that really was the idea that led to the establishment of this hub. Now, how we are going to do that has been left for us to define collectively, and that's really what we have started doing. Uh, that journey is not complete, but this evening is part of the definition of, of one of the challenges that we need to face. But um, uh, at this moment, I'd really like to ask uh, Thomas Steffens, the Secretary uh, for Health in Germany, to say a few words on behalf of the German government, and welcome you to this event this evening. Thank you very much. Thomas, please. Chikwa, colleagues, distinguished um, guests, uh, let me first of all thank you for this kind invitation to join you uh, this uh, evening for this very important event on the complexity of uh, pandemics and, of course, uh, data preparedness. And I guess we are all well prepared for the next uh, pandemic, but we still have to work on the data and the data sharing. That is why we are all together uh, tonight uh, to see what we can do as the next uh, steps. And um, Chikwe just um, reminded us of, uh, of the beginning and of all the walls that you have um, uh, around us and we have a lot of experience with walls in Berlin, you know. Um, and this is a very nice example of a very constructive uh, wall around uh, the hub to protect you and to protect uh, all of us. And it's a solid basis, I would uh, call it, for our, future, for our future work. And I still remember our very first um, moments and events last year, also during the G7 uh, presidency, where we had the outbreak simulation exercise for the G7 um, health ministers. I guess it was a very successful uh, event. There are a lot of colleagues around uh, who joined us uh, at that time, and it illustrated how much, I would call it, we are still vulnerable, but we have to overcome that situation and we have to work closely uh, together to overcome that uh, situation. And in Germany, um, I I think I should stress that, but you already know that. We strongly believe in uh, the approach of multilateralism. 
We strongly believe in the WHO. Sometimes a little bit reminds me of you, what you can uh, read uh, on a US banknote. It's not written in God we trust, but in the WHO we trust, you know? And this is uh, what it's all about, that we believe in multilateralism and we believe really in the work of the WHO. And this hub, Chiquis has said that, is a hub located in Berlin, but it's very much a global uh, hub. And with our contribution, we simply want to contribute to the safety uh, of the world and to overcome this today's situation and to build up a better world uh, for the future, to be better prepared for future uh, pandemics together. While we agree on the importance of medical countermeasures and related uh, questions of uh, equity, and these are all very, very important questions, we also believe that we need, again, a stronger political focus on pandemic prevention and pandemic uh, preparedness. This includes investments into collaborative surveillance, including data preparedness and the highly skilled workforce that we had been uh, discussing many, many uh, times uh, in the past to generate and to use this data we are talking about. We are all concerned that due to other challenges in today's world, this focus currently might be fading away. And also, this is why we are here, Chikwit, to remind the world that we still have to work on the pandemic despite all the other challenges uh, in the world. Therefore, we believe that we need to increase our efforts to around the globe to cooperate and to cooperate. This, as well as common standards and interoperability, is a very, very crucial uh, point. We need an approach that is integrated and cross-sectoral, and one fundamental uh, role of the WHO hub is to support and to convince countries and people in these countries to join and to apply this critical approach. Innovative solutions like the epidemic intelligence from open sources, as an example, can pave the way, and we hope that the WHO hub can become an innovator and convener of much-needed expertise. Most health systems around the globe struggled in obtaining and analyzing real-time data during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We all know that. Let us be sure that this will not and will not, might not uh, happen again in the future. Let us continue to establish innovative ways of working uh, together and not only to establish them, but also to implement uh, them, which is very, very important. And Germany, I said that, is ready to do its part and to cooperate closely with you, with all of you and other relevant partners at a political as well as a technical level. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Stefan. Um, I just want to re reiterate some of Chikwe's comments about the importance of the German government's leadership, not just here in establishing the WHO hub, but also Germany's leadership in the policy, technical, and financial space, particularly in multilateralism, that's been critical in preparing for and responding to public health threats throughout the world. So thank you so much. I'm now pleased to present a greeting from Dr. Young Mi Ji, who's the commissioner and lead of the Korea CDC, or sorry, the Korea Center for Disease and Prevention Agency. Hello, everyone. I'm Young Mi Ji, commissioner of the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency. First of all, I'd like to express my sincere congratulations on the WHO Hope for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence in Berlin. Our hope to officially end this pandemic is on the horizon. Now is the time to stand ready for data preparedness. Data collection and sharing must be done in standardized format as much as possible. We believe that WHO Berlin Hub will bring us new ways of facilitating a, a global collaboration for collecting, analyzing, and sharing data for decision decision-making to address future pandemics and epidemics. In that sense, I would like to sincerely uh, thank German government for supporting this initiative and 
Also, I'm happy to mention that uh, Korea DCA has sent one second to join this Berlin hub earlier this year. I'm sure that the collaboration uh, between WHO Berlin Hub and Korea DCA will be closer and productive during the coming years. Know the enemy and know yourself. In 100 battles, you will never be in peril. This quote emphasized the power of in information as the key to winning a war such as uh, COVID-19. The Korean government stand ready to share know-how and technologies with the WH Pandemic Hub and other countries. Uh, in the near future, I hope to have an opportunity to share our progress on Korea's infectious disease control information system. The end of COVID pandemic is in sight. Now is the time to get ready for data preparedness for future pandemics, and we all need to take actions. With the WH Pandemic Hub working at the heart of such efforts, the Korean government will be a steadfast supporter of this journey. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank Dr. G for sending this thoughtful message, even though she wasn't able to join us in person. Um, and just to note that partnerships are really at the heart of WHO's uh, pandemic hub. Um, and our, and our, our, our way of succeeding in our vision for collaborative surveillance and intelligence. And with this, we welcome expertise from throughout the world to work with our staff and our partners based here in our offices. And as Dr. G noted, our very first seconded staff in Berlin is from the Korea DCA. And we look forward to replicating this model with other national public health agencies and partners. So if you are interested in hearing more about this, please come find me and my colleagues tonight and we'd be happy to discuss it with you. So with that, I want to introduce our first speaker, Professor Stephen Riley. Uh, Professor Riley has been the Director General of Data Analytics and Surveillance at the UK Health Security Agency since October 2021. Prior to joining UK HSA, he was Professor of Infectious Disease Dynamics at Imperial College London. In this role, he worked as part of the team that helped model the scale and progress of the COVID-19 pandemic and informed government decisions on measures necessary to control its spread. The Data Analytics and Surveillance Group at UK HSA is focused on putting the full power of health and non-health data into the hands of those who need it. They're also enabling the health protection ecosystem through the provision of world-class analytics capability to inform health protection activities, decision-making, actions, and outcomes. And that is a lot to live up to. <laughs> so I want to welcome Stephen, please, to the stage. Just wait for a second for the slides to appear. But thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be part of, uh, of the first in-person event here. It's a real honor. Um, uh, and thank you for the kind introduction. So I'm going to talk about pandemic data preparedness. And we could define that if we wanted to. We could define that as uh, the, during the next pandemic emergency, being able to make the best possible use of data to inform decisions. And that's decisions made by national governments made by local and regional decision makers, made by individuals, made by households. Maybe in the discussion we can look at some other aspects that we might define, but I think that's a good place to start. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just talk about the challenges, the threats, why we're here, and then really go through three takeaway messages that reflect, I think, the journey that we're on in the UK at the moment. Um, so, the three takeaways that I'm going to try and support. Firstly, it's mainly about people. It's the people that create insight and consume it, and it's people that make decisions. Those people need processes, they need tech and platforms. And the basic model that most of us need is probably quite straightforward. But the way we implement it and the efficiency with which you implement it is anything but straightforward. So because of that, the final takeaway is choosing our priorities right now is important and it's not easy. And I'll try and, if we get a few minutes, to just talk about some of the trade-offs that people are having to consider. <clears throat> so just thinking about the challenges for a minute or two. 
most people will be here today because they've got some role in reducing harms from, di from um, rapidly changing infectious disease or environmental threats. Those harms can be direct or indirect. These are recent examples that many of us have had experience with. I think it's important from the outset to say that it's not just data that contributes to decisions. There's lots of scientific context, other colleagues from across government, other stakeholders, and background knowledge. So we shouldn't pretend that it's only data that contributes through to decisions. But equally, the world has changed. There is so much data out there, and so many people are able to consume it, that any substantial organization needs a really strong presence even if it's defensive to some degree, you've got to know how to ingest and interpret the data. And I think that we have made a lot of progress and I think there were lots of excellent decisions and there was lots of fantastic contribution of data during COVID-19 and it does reflect a lot of progress. And many people will be aware that it's three years since some of the most difficult decisions that were made during the start of the pandemic. <clears throat> but it's probably not quite as high awareness that it's almost exactly 20 years since the height of public concern during SARS-1. There was an outbreak on a housing estate in Hong Kong almost 20 years to the day called Amoy Gardens, and it looked like exponential increase of a coronavirus with a high mortality rate. So as I said, we did make a lot of progress in our ability to consume data and support decisions in those intervening years. I think today, part of our job is to look forward 10 or 20 years after the experience of the pandemic and say, what more progress do we need to make? What better capabilities and functionality do we need to say? When the people we are hiring this month and this year are sat in this room, hopefully we're somewhere else skiing. But those people that we hire when they're having that conversation, what will they be talking about? Okay, so just going on to talk through those kind of key points. I love data, I love code, I love producing insight. It's an absolute passion and we often jump straight to the data. But really, it is people first. As I said, it's people that generate and consume the insight. I'm sure there'll be some mentioning of artificial intelligence today. You can't have a conversation with more than three people at the moment and not think about it. But the accountability and the responsibility is going to rest with people, hopefully, for a long time. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the size and diversity of the human talent pool grew almost as quickly as the virus did during those first few months. It was not easy. There was a lot of noise, and there were some obvious issues with the, with the human contribution growing so rapidly. But it supported fantastic insight diverse thought and a whole range of new techniques that came to the field. We can't keep all of that talent, and nor would we want to. It wouldn't be the right thing to do. So it's going off, the talent's going off and doing different things, and we're trying to design those communities going forward. And I think it's really difficult. That's probably the biggest challenge that we have right now. UKHSA and the data analytics, we want to be a career destination. We want to build and reward skills. We want to keep pace with innovation. And then most relevant for tonight, we want to collaborate with partners locally and globally. So we've talked about how it's, I've talked about how it's the people that generate the insight, but it's communicated over personal relationships. Not necessary, or it's communicated over human relationships. They can be based in your institution. They can be based in your role. But my experience from dealing, helping to contribute to emergencies over a long period of time is the insight and the data and the code to some degree flows along those existing relationships. So the hub is a fantastic example and in the most literal sense of convening a network of the right people and we can spread out the ideas and that philosophy from here. So um, again, thank you for the invite. And so just to move on to the second, you know, slightly, you know, uh, less, uh, potentially less inspirational or less forward-looking. This is, um, we're part of the Data Analytics and Surveillance Group at the UK Health Security Agency. The agency was formed from Public Health England, Test and Trace, and the Joint Biosecurity Centre. And in the new organisation, we have an entire group dedicated to data analytics and surveillance, which is new. The predecessor organisation didn't have that. So that's the first point. 
we've made sure that these issues are represented at the highest level of governance. So at the very least, they're not forgotten. And we're trying to ensure that kind of new ways of working are embedded in the new organization. And then the way within our group, the way we're organized is following what a lot of people call the data value chain. You'll see very similar organizations in commercial and uh, technical organizations all across the world. It starts from being able to have safe systems to ingest the data um, and to make sure you obtain it legally. If you need new data, for example, the ONS study or the REACT study, which is close to my own heart, they were commissioned from the groups working in our data and cybersecurity directorate. Once the data comes in, the second section, data operations, probably the largest part of our, uh, uh, of our group, has to provide the systems into which the data lands, where it's cleaned, where it's curated, and then where it's provided. An example of the type of systems that we're trying to develop is the Enterprise Data and Analytics Platform, or EDAP. During the pandemic, there were some very impressive systems stood up very quickly, but they were very expensive. We're having to try and re-engineer much more efficient systems for the long term. Moving on a bit more quickly, the next step is the analytics and data science with our data scientists, epidemiologists, GIS experts who add the value and support out across the whole of the agency. I should emphasize, we are called data analytics and surveillance, but those activities are done throughout the UK Health Security Agency by lots of talented professionals, and we support them, especially through the provision of code through analytics and data science. And then finally, all hazards intelligence at the very end of the value chain, where we try to synthesize lots of expert knowledge from within and without the agency, add it onto the analytics, and produce kind of fully synthesized products. The, the idea is that this is kind of slightly changes the way we work. In an emergency, has got very high value and is set up and ready to go. And during non-emergency times, helps to support all of the work that's being done by the agency. Okay. So I'll speed up a little bit. And then finally, just um, think a little bit about the difficult trade-offs. The images on this slide outline some of the trade-offs that happen to be made. So picture on the left is from the 1918 pandemic. Many will have seen it a lot before. And on the right, it's showing hospitals and social care. There's an idea that we don't have to worry about the pandemic for another 100 years. Therefore, it's very difficult to make those investment decisions because we're having to trade off against direct care for patients or for people in social care settings. I think what we have, there's two points we have to consider. Firstly, we do expect, even though it's not a central assumption, there is a risk of a COVID-like event in the next 10 or 20 years. And we have to, because of the stakes, we have to prepare accordingly. And then the second point, as I mentioned before, most of what we do, most of the investment in data preparedness should improve the day-to-day -day work that we have to do in these agencies anyway. So I think I've just about reached the end of my time. I'll just um, pop the summary up there again. Hopefully, I've supported the idea that the people are the most important part of what we need to do right now. Processes, easy to describe, quite difficult to actually implement in an efficient way, and that the, those prioritizations need careful thought, and now's the time we need to do them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I just want to flag one of your very important key points, and it's really close to my heart, and it's really at the core of the objective of the hub. And that's that you noted while systems and platforms are important, they're dependent on the people. Um, and these people have specialized skills, and they are also in very high demand. And I know Chick Ways described our work at the Hub not just as focusing on communities of practice, but focusing on communities of practitioners. And so I think your message really resonates with us in how we do business. Um, I also want to thank you for emphasizing that when emergencies happen, it's these networks of human beings, and not necessarily the data connections that are making things work. So appreciate it.
Um, I now want to introduce our next speaker, um, and that is, um, we earlier had the opportunity to hear from Dr. G, who is the commissioner of the Korea DCA, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sung Woo Tak, who is the director for risk assessment at the Bureau of Public Health Emergency Response and Preparedness at Korea DCA. In this role, Dr. Tak leads epidemic intelligence and global health surveillance, as well as rapid risk assessments. Before joining KDCA, he was an associate research professor at Seoul National University, focusing on biosurveillance and global health security issues. Previously, he worked as a public health expert on biosurveillance with the U.S. Department of Defense and collaborated with the Korean Ministry of National Defense. And from 2005 to 2011, Dr. Tak served as an epidemiologist at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he participated in the responses to public health emergencies such as Hurricane Katrina, the H1N1 pandemic, and Deepwater Horizon. So welcome, Sung Woo. Hello, honorable guests, distinguished experts and professionals and colleagues. Um, it's really exciting to be here and celebrating together on the anniversary of WHO Hub, Pandemic and Epidemic um, Intelligence. I was excited to be here initially, but now the time pressure to make my ideas um, into this 10 slide, 10 minute. It's really nerve-wracking, but I'll do the best I can. So don't read the title, read the disclaimer. So these opinions are only mine, and they don't re represent the KDCA's official view. I hope it does, but it never happens. So. <laughs> this is pretty famous um, graph. A lot of people, oh, many of you have seen this. Um, they say the number of countries experiencing significant um, disease outbreaks around the world has been increasing since 2010 or 11, and this was presented on, in 2019 on uh, Harvard Global Health Institute and World Economic Forum. Um, they analyzed this WHO DONs and they come up with this. So this risk or you know, hazard has increased since then, but they talked about this urbanization and population, displaced population increase, and the climate change, and etc. But they don't talk about the surveillance capacity. And I looked into this graph to make sure that what we see is correctly um, defined. And I found these two very important guidelines. WHO 2008, they published a guideline to um, help those countries establishing event-based surveillance. And also they published um, implementation guideline in 2014. So I looked further and I did the PubMed search using the event-based surveillance. Um, since 2000, I used the, the term um, that was used in title and abstract. And there was about um, 200 or so papers as you can see, the first paper appeared in 2010, and since then, we've seen huge increase in the number of publications. So maybe it's not the number of outbreaks um, we detected, maybe it's the number of countries with um, surveillance capacity being able to report those significant um, outbreaks. So I looked further, and I looked at the IHR score. Um, you can read the pa whole paper. Um, it's, I put the reference down there. But they compared the IHR um, self-report score with the JEE external evaluation result. And as you can see, the surveillance has the highest score, almost 88 um, in 2016 out of 100 full score. In 2017, it's slightly lower. But as you can see, it's probably the highest um, score um, compared to other um, you know, uh, core capacities, uh, such as preparedness, risk communication, human resource. Human resource is probably the lowest. So we're pretty good until we had this. So COVID-19 pandemic, it has affected um, in many ways of surveillance, the business we're doing but also showed the same old disparity um, 
in reporting among those countries. As you can see, on your left side, it's um, cumulative incidence rate um, that reported by those countries. And France, South Korea all are making the top. But also, if you look at the bottom, low-income countries or lower-middle-income countries has very low incidence rates. It's possible, um, you know, given the populations and aging population, etc. So, it, you know, we, we see this kind of variability um, all the time. But if you look at the case fatality rate, um, you know, I'm an epidemiologist, and case, case fatality rate used to be sort of epidemiological characteristic. We call that parameter. It's sort of given to a given pathogen. So each specific pathogen has very unique case fatality rate. But if you look at the variability, we still see the variability across the countries. Um, you know, incidence rate is very low in those low-income countries and lower-middle-income countries. But why case fatality rate as well? So... Um, I didn't understand the, the variability, so I looked further. So a lot of people say low-income countries have very low access to uh, medical care service, and you know, public health infrastructure is limited, and resource is still in need. So I compare those case fatality rates, or CFRs, and if you look at the crude CFRs um, across those countries, you see huge variability. On your left side, you see the seasonal change, the seasonal trend, but still there is a variability across different countries. I try to adjust for those variability for many different factors, um, assuming that maybe that's because they're medical care services or uh, workforce, etc. So I adjusted for many different variables. But I, after the adjustment, I still saw the variability. It, you know, the seasonal pattern has gone away, but still there's um, you know, zero to five percent variability. So why is that? So I think it has to do with the um, um, surveillance capacity. I don't know how to um, measure that capacity in a way, but I came up with this um, sort of question about availability, or since we're talking about data preparedness, I assume, assume that if those data sets are available for use, some people might try to connect and link those different data sets for their specific research question or study purpose. So I ended up looking at the publications that used two or more different data sets um, looking at infectious disease outcomes. So on your left, you see the linkages between two different data sets. And uh, there aren't many publications. I looked at the publications from 2009 to 2018, almost 10 years. And as you can see, the North America, Canada, and U United States has the highest number of publications that used linked data sets. And Europe has a lot, and also Australia has a lot. If you look at the you know, South America and African countries and Asian countries, the numbers are pretty small. So where is this disparity um, is coming from? And I think we still have a lot of homework to do. I had an opportunity to lead a project that's called Biosurveillance Project where we can sort of bring in a different agencies, um, administrative data, health-related data, so we can come up with this big platform where you can do a lot of hybrid or you know, fusion analysis, linking different data sets. Um, and I ended up surveying those different agencies. So out of 12 different agencies, um, 35 divisions covering um, 34 respondents, uh, respondents uh, answered the question about what would be the most expected function of the biosurveillance platform if we are able to create one. And almost half of the resp um, responders asked, um, answered the question saying we need to communicate with other agencies. So there's a huge need to connect even within one country domestically, but different agencies are not really talking enough. And I also asked the question about what would be the most critical enablers to have a successful operation of that platform if we have one. 
And majority of people say, yes, uh, we need a legislation and a law to dictate, to collect different data sets from different um, agencies. We don't have that law yet, but we are working on it. And it was followed by the workforce requirement. Um, this, is, this is my last um, slide. I, I prepared one talking point, but I missed it. But since we are here at the hub, um, maybe there is a way to connect our you know, members and you know, co colleagues in different countries. There are many ways to have this kind of network. And on your left, maybe the centralized network system is what we're um, working on. Maybe not. But I think ideally, on your right side, all these members and, you know, Components are connected, so if one failed, still the network is working. And if it's too ideal or too lofty, it's not feasible, maybe we can work with the middle ground and saying, so come up with some sort of hybrid um, system where there is this centralized communication and network, but also working regionally and locally. And... Who knows, maybe someday we can have this kind of um, decentralized network for public health and epidemic intelligence. So maybe it's time to connect, shall we? Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Seng Wu. Uh, you said something this morning in a discussion that really resonated with me and that I wanted to bring up tonight. And you said it's not data that we need, but it's information. And we need to focus on data collaboration and not, and not data sharing. Um, and I think you illustrated that really well uh, with your experience in Korea establishing a multi-agency integrated biosurveillance system. And really what you needed to focus on were the processes around the communication and process around information sharing. So thank you very much for uh, re your reminder that we're working in this very complex ecosystem. Um, and for our final presenter, I would like to introduce Alicia Sahu Khan. Um, she is, Dr. Sahu Khan is for the founding head of the Health Protection Agency at the Ministry of Health and Medical Services of Fiji. In this role, she leads the Fiji Center for Disease Control, the Environmental Health Unit, as well as the Health Emergencies and Climate Change Department. And that's my emphasis, because that seems like a lot of responsibilities for a single person. Um, Alicia is a medical doctor specializing in public health and infectious disease epidemiology and has chaired national health task forces and led responses to multiple epidemics. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Alicia served on the health leadership team and was a national spokesperson and technical lead for Fiji's pandemic response. She also represents Fiji on WHO's intergovernmental negotiating body as well as the review committee for IHR. So welcome, Alicia. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank you especially to Dr. Chikwe and the Hub for inviting me here. It, I think it's a testament to the collaborative nature of this Hub that you invited someone all the way from Fiji, which is, um, in case you don't know, is a very long way away. So just to orient you to Fiji, first of all. Fiji is a group of islands in the Pacific, um, in the Pacific, in between Australia and New Zealand. I'm sure you know those countries. Um, there's over 300 islands, and just over half of them are inhabited. Um, the, it has a primarily national health system, and which is managed by the Ministry of Health and Medical Services. We also have a private um, sector healthcare system, which is rapidly growing. Um, in the last 20 years, uh, the first private hospital opened, and now we have uh, approximately five. There are four geographical medical divisions, and in those we have three divisional hospitals, which could be classified as tertiary-level hospitals. 
Now, Fiji, Fiji CDC. Fiji CDC, as has been mentioned, is under the Division of Health Protection in the Ministry of Health and Medical Services. It has existed for a few decades with, um, in different iterations, different names. But essentially, it is the focal point for pre preparedness and response to communicable diseases of public health concern in Fiji. Um, it consists of a national public health laboratory, a surveillance unit, a vaccine preventable diseases unit, neglected, neg neglected tropical diseases, and a vector control unit. Fiji CDC is also part of the Pacific Public Health Surveillance Network, the PPHSN, which is made up of 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. And through that, we contribute through the Pacific Syndromic Surveillance System as well as through LabNet, where we are one of four level two laboratories in the Pacific which accept samples for testing for specific pathogens as well as conduct training. Um, the other laboratories, of course, in French Polynesia, New Caledonia, and Guam. We manage almost all of the infectious disease surveillance systems in Fiji, inclu including the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, the Early Warning Alert and Response System, which was set up um, as an emergency system after Category 5 Cyclone uh, Winston in 2016 with WHO, hospital-based act active surveillance, which is primarily looking at vaccine-preventable diseases, um, influenza surveillance, uh, which is including syndromic surveillance, virological surveillance, and SARI surveillance, and of course COVID-19. Before I go into our data preparedness, I'd like to highlight significant events that have led to progress um, in terms of our data preparedness and um, health emergency preparedness and response. Again, learning and progressing through crisis, which is a very familiar concept to all of us. H1N1 in 2009. What H1N1 brought to Fiji was an awareness of the need to conduct infectious disease surveillance in a systematic way. It also gave us a national influenza center so we could start testing uh, for um, influenza viruses. And we, through that, we became part of the Global Influenza Surveillance Network, GIZES. We started surveilling for our, pan our epidemic-prone diseases, leptospirosis, typhoid fever, and dengue fever. This was very basic, um, essentially getting our laboratories to send us the Excel spreadsheets of their, of, their, of their cases. Then in, cat, in um, 2016, we had a Category 5 tropical cyclone, Cyclone Winston, and that is when EWAS was set up. We also noticed after Cyclone Winston a dramatic increase in leptospirosis cases, in particular in Fiji. We would record about hundreds every year, now we're recording thousands. Then in 2018, we had a meningococcal C outbreak, um, invasive meningococcal disease used to be very rare in Fiji. We had less than 10 cases a year. Suddenly, we had a tenfold increase in cases. And through that outbreak, um, the, the um, value of molecular diagnostics was recognized. It was also recognized that we needed to have a surveillance unit within the Ministry of Health. Previously, we, um, we had the support of development partners to fund positions, now the Ministry of Health actually funded positions, permanent positions within the ministry for surveillance officers at the national level at Fiji CDC, as well as out in the divisions. And then in 2019, we had the measles outbreak, which really was running on the tail of the COVID-19 pandemic. The measles outbreak in Fiji began in November 2019, ended in January. During that time, we conducted activities such as rapid case detection, isolation, quarantine, Contact tracing, all very familiar terms to all of us now. Pre-pandemic, this is what our data flows look like. Essentially, it's a health facility-based system. A patient comes to a, a health facility, sees a doctor or a nurse practitioner. The doctor writes out a lab form and a test that goes to the laboratory. Laboratory enters that into an Excel spreadsheet sends the result back to the clinician, sends the spreadsheet onto CDC as well as, the, well as the divisional health team. This process can take weeks, even up to a month, before we get that data. Um, we also have EWARS, which is a much faster system. They, um, they communicate that syndromic surveillance data to the divisional surveillance officer in the division, and every week we get a report along with alerts 
as to whether we have passed the threshold for a certain syndrome, for example, acute fever and rash, influenza-like illness, uh, dengue-like illness. During the pandemic, it became very clear quite quickly that our normal um, paper-based system with Excel spreadsheets was not up to par. It's particularly when you, in the start of the pandemic in 2020, our lab testing capacity was about 80 to 100 samples a day. It moved up to about 3,000 to 4,000 samples a day. At first, we threw more people at the problem, boosting our data entry personnel. However, very quickly, it was quite clear it was a very inefficient system. You're essentially entering data twice. First, someone is filling out a form, and then someone is entering something into a spreadsheet, the very same data. So we, and also, um, the, we weren't getting samples just from patients anymore. They were coming from contacts, they were coming from travelers, they were coming from clinicians and swab teams. So we um, had an, a mobile app that used data from our vaccine vaccine registration system for COVID-19, pulling in that elect electronic me medical record, so making it simpler for our clinicians and frontliners to enter data. Of course, EWAS was running along the that line as well. So we had um, close to 670,000 tests in total so far in the pandemic, and out of that, about 263,000 were registered on that system. Moving forward, this is what we would like to see in the future. Essentially, through the support of the Korean um, International Cooperation Agency and the WHO, we are funding for a complete overhaul of our infectious disease surveillance system and linking that data to climate change. So in blue, you can see all of the human health section of the surveillance system, which is based on a national notifiable disease system, and an EMR, which is very important to reduce the burden on our frontline healthcare workers. And then still looking at humans, but more into a community-based surveillance system with participatory surveillance once those approvals are through, which is a voluntary um, system called flu tracking, which is used in, in Australia and New Zealand, as well as using our extensive network of community health workers who are paid by the Fiji government uh, to also register um, unusual events and um, indicator-based surveillance through the existing system which exists through the Fiji Red Cross. And then in the future, also being able to report things like bird, bird die-offs, etc., into that system. And then on the other side, of course, still sticking with the environment, collecting relevant um, Fiji Met data um, into the system as well. Future, some very quick future directions. As you can see, there are quite a lot there. Um, we have a new pathogen genomics laboratory. We're looking at a FETP. And then, of course, um, further developments, including reforming the digital health strategy, having a digital vaccine registry beyond COVID-19. And, of course, we've already started mass drug administration for lymphatic fluorisis using a digital system. Challenges. This has been mentioned many times. We cannot forget the building blocks of digital health, which includes people, healthcare, non healthcare, including IT staff, the infrastructure that goes along with having a digital system, as well as software. These are the very basics that we may forget when it comes to data preparedness, but are very important, particularly in developing countries. And then sustaining that system into the future beyond COVID 19. Technical support, particularly mathematical models that will link our disease data to climate data. And the one I haven't put up on the slide yet, but in Fiji, a recent um, multi-indicator cluster survey showed that 80% of households have access to the internet, 76% of adults own a mobile phone. So we really should be trying to make use of that and looking at social media to see how we can pull that data out and use it for early, um, early alerts. I'm, this is my last two slides, but I thought it was very important. This is a, at a recent um, Super Rugby game in Fiji. To give you an idea, Super Rugby is a professional men's rugby union um, tournament played between Australia and New Zealand, previously South Africa, and Japan were part of this league as well. <coughs> However, um, just in the last year, 
in the last year, Fiji and the Pacific Islands were allowed to introduce teams. So this is a game between the Fijian Drua and the Canterbury Crusaders. Canterbury Crusaders are the champions. Fijian Drua have just started, and they beat the they beat the Crusaders by one point in a home game. And this is a photo of a family. The little boy is standing on the shoulders of his sister, just so he can watch the game. They didn't have tickets to enter the game. And of course, this went viral in Fiji, and it was on the front page of one of our national univers- no, um, newspapers. Now, when I saw that, it brought to mind this very famous picture that has gone went viral a few years ago. So this is a photo of kids watching a baseball game, and it shows the differences between equality and equity. Equality is you treat everybody the same. What happens? Is that you don't necessarily give people what they need to achieve the outcome that you're intending. In this case, the outcome is watching the game. When you're talking about equity, you're giving everybody what they need and what is fair, and it's not quite fairness because we actually have a mutual interest in the outcome. In this case, it's watching a baseball game. In our case, it's early detection and response. And if we don't all have that capacity, We really are just laying a bet as to which country we will be the next one to find the next, next pandemic virus or pathogen. So we hope that it's a country that will be able to catch it quickly and respond quickly. But is that a bet you are willing to make? I certainly am not. Um, so when it comes, this this uh, phrase has been used extensively. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe, and I think it certainly rings true. For early detection and response to possible path- pandemic pathogens in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Alicia. Uh, you made a couple of really important points on how institutions and data needs evolved in Fiji and different responses to public health emergencies. And during this evolution, it was critical for them to ad- address fragmentation as well as to digitize. And I think this is an excellent example of how data preparedness requires us to take a really critical look at our systems, how efficient they are, as well as the equity of our systems, as you pointed out. So I really want to thank you for ensuring that these country-level discussions um, stay at the forefront. Front of our, of our work um, and our conversations here tonight. Uh, so um, we are now going to be moving on to the panel discussion. Um, so I want to again a warm thanks to our speakers, uh, and we're looking forward to talking in more depth with you. Um, right now, they're setting up the stage, um, and while they're doing that, I just want to remind everybody that you're going to have the opportunity to pose questions to the panel. Online, you've already received a link, and、um, anybody in the audience has a QR code on their flyer right here. So you can pose questions, but you can also vote up questions that other people have posed. And with that, I'd like to now introduce、uh, Dr. Oliver Morgan, who's the director for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence Systems here at the Hub, and he will be moderating the panel discussion tonight. Good evening. Thank you very much, everybody.、Uh, it's a r- real pleasure to be here. I'm going to invite my uh, colleagues, uh, my speakers,、uh, the speakers, to come and join me.、Um, and as they're coming up,、uh, I wanted to share with you that actually today we've been meeting with、uh, a number of thought leaders from around the world in、uh, what I call like a wraparound event, which is、uh, a workshop that we've been holding today and will continue tomorrow about data preparedness. Um, and、uh, we thought this would be a great opportunity to bring people together. And as Chikwe mentioned, we have colleagues from many different countries from around the world here sharing their experiences as well. And so, please,、uh, for the members of、uh, of you in the audience, please、uh, take an opportunity to also engage with them、um, uh, as we、uh, when we wrap up this、uh, part of the session and we.、Um, Have the discussion afterwards. So I'd like to、uh, welcome my colleagues and thank them、uh, for their great presentations and、uh, get the discussion session、uh, up and running.、Um, while your questions are coming in,、um, and please type in your questions and、uh, into the online platform. I thought we would just、uh, begin by touching on、uh, something that's obviously topical for the hub, which is international collaborations. 
and in the context of data preparedness. We've heard of these great initiatives that you have ongoing in your own countries about strengthening and uh, upgrading your data infrastructure and thinking around data. But how does that play out in the international context and how do you see that from the national perspective? How can we at the Hub work with you to also strengthen international uh, data preparedness? Maybe we'll start with Stephen and come, excuse me, we'll come back this way. So, uh, thank you very much. The, I mean, I think there's, there are different types of data and they're, they're important in their different ways. Um, and I think when you're considering how better to collaborate internationally, you can look at some best case or you know, uh, some excellent examples and then think out how we might be able to kind of learn from them. Looking back over the last couple of decades, I think genomic data has moved from being a very difficult, complex area for data sharing to having some real success stories associated with it. I think outbreak data and epi data is more complicated than that. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a really high priority. So from, from our point of view, given the, the challenges that we're trying to assess, I think one thing that we would like to do is, is think about how better to share epi and outbreak data in the public domain, um, and that would be a priority. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Alicia, some thoughts about international collaborations and how our, our collaborations can also foster greater international data preparedness from a member state perspective. There's a lot to learn about um, what's happened in the um, data preparedness space internationally. And I think a lot of those lessons can be applied to countries like my own, which are really um, starting out in digitalizing our, our surveillance systems. At the same time, it's really necessary to be able to contextualize to the country's scenario. I come from a Pacific small island developing state. What works in Fiji may not necessarily work in Germany or vice versa. So it's really important to be able to set standards, but also contextualize according to um, the country setting. Great. It sounds like we have our work cut out for us, um, <laughs> but actually extremely important to both somehow capture uh, some global and regional standards, but also keep the contextual piece uh, in the forefront of our minds. Uh, Sangwoo, in, your, your, um, in your work in, in Korea, KDCA, uh, how have you started to think about that international connection between KDCA and other public health agencies and the WHO? Um, I actually worked in the global health sector for quite a while, and I had this sort of unique um, perspective. I look at the globe, but also work in the domestic setting. And um, I don't know how many minutes do I have, but um, so I'll say it anyway. I'm not going to ask how many you need. But <laughs> All right, that's great. Um, I'm a huge fan of Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if you know that uh, author. He's the author of um, um, A Blink and Outliers. And one of, one of his recent talks um, was about this um, um, game. Uh, he was um, using this analogy um, that looking at the research, uh, looking at the basketball game and the base um, the football game, and the research was looking at high-performing, successful basketball teams and comparing to football teams. And the conclusion was that basketball game, you only need uh, three best players. It doesn't matter whether you have um, low-performing players in the team. As long as you have three best players in the team, you're better off. But in the football game, it's a lot more complicated and complex. It has a lot of um, um, you know, probability issues. You don't know how you are going to be able to play that game. So high-performing teams have all these players above the average. They don't have any um, low-performing players in the team. So you have to have this at least above the average playing players in the team to be able to a successful um, a football team. I, I think what we deal with here in the public health is also um, unknown and unpredictable. So uh, I think we are playing a football game instead of basketball game, and we want to make sure that all the players can play above the average and make sure that no players are left behind 
And you know, without making sure these players on the field um, with a similar approach, um, nice talk, and you raise that issue, um, equity is just important. And I, I want to make sure that um, we have this meritocracy uh, approach in the public health. We value high-performing countries and members and partners, but still we need to um, make sure that all the you know team workers and our colleagues are following up and they're not being left behind. Great, thank you very much. Two minutes, thank you. Yeah, I'll shut up. Perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> uh, we, we have uh, several questions coming in online. Um, I'll just pick uh, one uh, slightly at random. And um, so this, I'll, I'll ask it to all three of you, just some uh, brief reflections from all three of you. Uh, do you think we can create data sharing platforms that can be multifunctional so there is ongoing activity in times without pandemics and people can see ongoing value. So maybe, maybe we'll, we'll just go around the same. Stephen, would you like to start us off? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that we definitely can. Um, and I think when we talk about any kind of sharing platform, we should try and be clear whether we mean fully public or whether we mean some kind of smaller group, some kind of bilateral sharing. Um, and I think especially if we look at the successful dashboards around the world that were used by many different stakeholders, if possible, we should be looking at multifunctional, fully open data sharing. And then, you know, the, I think that by giving access to many, many different people, we'll find all kinds of value that maybe we don't anticipate when we set it up. So I think definitely we should aim for that. Mm -hmm. Alicia, from the Fiji perspective? Yeah, I would definitely, in order to scale up to, during a pandemic, we do need to have something existing in so-called peace times. At the same time, we do acknowledge that there is a general waning of interest in um, all of the resources that were dedicated during the pandemic. So we also have to find a way to reestablish that interest, look at the long term, at the national level, regional level, as well as, well as the international level. So what are the benefits of sharing um, to an individual country? Okay, thanks. Same way. Well, I spent a lot of time on this. Um, you know, when, when we have this sort of integrated um, data platform, and I thought about what are we going to do with the data? And one of the ideas was, you know, linking those different data sets and for a research purpose. But there aren't many ideas about what we are going to do with the data. And I was, I was looking at a fusion analysis. I was looking at different hybrid analytics. I think that's where we need to focus on, you know, the coming up with this different approach to analytics and, you know, analysis solutions that can serve different purposes for, you know, different uh, member states. Great. Well, I'm going to just uh, touch on the, the dreaded topic of AI. Uh, you mentioned it, Stephen, I think preemptively, but uh, you're not going to get away with it that easily. Um, because it's really everywhere right now in the news, and uh, I think it, uh, it really raises many interesting questions. But the dimension that I'd like to explore with you tonight is really the balance between AI as technology versus our investments in workforce. So we've all, you've all mentioned various aspects about the need to invest in both technology and workforce. Do you think uh, there's uh, a, a challenge for us to message, uh, certainly to our uh, decision makers in government and uh, financial um, uh, decision makers in government, about what is the right balance between investing in workforce and the right balance about investing in new technology? Maybe, uh, Alicia, I'll, I'll ask, uh, maybe you would like to start with that one. Yeah, um, so coming from a global south country, developing country perspective, the, the basics will always be necessary. The, you know, things like infrastructure, having the basic workforce in, in place, who is going to collect your data, who is going to be in charge of maintaining the hardware and the software of your system. I don't think that that will really ever be replaced. Um, AI may come in, and I think it will have a great many really good uses, including in developing countries. But really, I don't think we can really 
get past those basics, which are essential. Great, thanks. Uh, Sangwoo, from, from your perspective? Um, I was always doubtful about the function and the role that AI can perform in public health, especially when it comes to using the surveillance data. I always thought making the decision about surveillance, having that establishing one um, is on the human side and also using that information to make that happen and realize as a public policy is also human side. So there is balance between this machine and the human. So both are important. But, I was, but that doubt has been thinning since I saw ChatGPT 4. So I don't know how it's going to lay out, but I'll stop there. That's where I am. <laughs> I think we'll have to come back and see uh, in time how this plays out. But Stephen, your, your reflections. Yeah, I think you're asking the question at a, exactly the right moment. Um, I don't think it's clear. I don't think it's clear yet. I think that um, engines such as ChatGPT and GPT-4 are going to change the way that we design systems, and they're going to have a big impact. Um, but I think the, the degree to which we train them on which we use engines trained on fully public data and the way that we solve the privacy and governance issues in order to try and train similar algorithms on, our, on, on non-public data, I think all of those questions are very difficult and not resolved. And you know, there are classic examples of, of you know, the, the Kindle, everyone said the Kindle would kill the bookshops and sales of paper books jumped up. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's really clear yet exactly how these learning algorithms are going to affect the way that our workforce generates insight. So I'm going to just totally dodge. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that's the, the the wise move is to is to stay on the fence for now. Um, so we have uh, several other questions coming in uh, online. Um, so uh, a question which I'll um, uh, maybe start uh, Sangwoo uh, with. Uh, I'll ask to you is. How do we get countries to see the value of surveillance and data preparedness for their own purposes rather than somehow an externally driven agenda that's linked to global rather than national health security? So I think this might be an interesting one, particularly from a, a Korean context. You know, even one um, domestically or internationally, it's rare to see um, one establish a surveillance from the ground, from the scratch. Uh, you know, often the approach we take is to look at the available data and information out there and try to um, address the issue on hand using those available data. And I think having those data or information available in a form that can be used for many different purposes, I think it's critical. So um, surveillance um, has to have a purpose, but the purpose will define what kind of information and the data you are going to look for. Great, thanks. And, and there's a question here on the chat specifically uh, for, for you, Alicia, about Fiji. And it's, uh, given the challenges you highlighted in the Fiji context, what are you, your hopes that some of these might be addressed through the outcomes of the uh, INB, the International Negotiating Body, and the IHR, International Health Regulations, uh, discussions at the moment? Yeah, uh, so I, I lead um, Fiji's team on the negotiations for the pandemic treaty. And we're constantly discussing equity, which is a very key theme running throughout um, the current uh, zero draft. But more importantly, operate, operationalizing equity. And so that's why in my presentation, I really highlighted when we're talking about data preparedness, we also need to talk about equity in ensuring that all countries have the capacities. And when you're going back to your question about how do we localize that interest, well, I, just, I mentioned about how we are trying to digitalize our surveillance systems and link it to climate data. For a small island developing state, that is highly relevant. In Fiji, in the Pacific, we're seeing an increase uh, in frequency of extreme weather events like tropical cyclones, an increase in ferocity um, in the strength of those cyclones. We see Category 4 and Category 5 cyclones just regularly now in every season. Um, so being able to develop a system that would be able to predict our climate-sensitive disease outbreaks like leptospirosis, typhoid, and dengue fever, it will be a great interest um, at the local level. 
Great, thank you very much. And, and to Stephen, here's another online question which I thought uh, you might, uh, might want to address. So do you think that we need internationally agreed standard data sharing agreements to enable the, the exchange of information which recognizes and credits those uh, that collect and share information? Yeah, yeah, I think I think we absolutely do, and uh, and again, I called out the the, youth, the genomic data as, as somewhat of a success story, and that community thought a lot about how you would give credit for data originators, um, and they've they've had a lot of success in getting the data shared more quickly and the insight generated, and, and people still getting credit. So I think we we do need to accept that data is expensive, it's difficult, and if we're going to share it very quickly. We need really robust mechanisms where people are credited. Absolutely. Great, thanks. And, and just to touch on that a bit more, the the credit sharing, do you think is uh, at the country level or the individual level, or how does that vary? Is it... So I think there are different um, there are different types of data. So there is, um, you know, the, uh, in the UK we did run a lot of studies during the pandemic to inform our response, but they were explicitly consented, we recruited people, they, they gave their permission. So those studies would have one particular way of sharing more quickly, um, whereas data that's obtained from the healthcare system would need a kind of bespoke way of crediting that whole, you know, the pipeline um, that would probably be a little bit different for each domain that it came from. Great. Sang Sangwoo, there was something you mentioned in your presentation which uh, I thought was really interesting, which was the interaction between different parts of government in terms of, well, you, you didn't call it data preparedness, but I think this is, uh, the, the intention was that other parts of government are also getting prepared uh, with their data infrastructure. So, uh, you know, how does that translate into the type of value chain that uh, Stephen was talking about? How do you go about constructing a value chain that expands beyond let's say the Ministry of Health, into other parts of government. It sounds like Korea is already going down that path. How is it? If you actually go back to the uh, table that I presented, the second highest um, answer was about uh, sharing the data analysis result. That they wanted to see how their data is being analyzed along with health data, and they wanted to see the result and implications as well. And I think um, the, the value is there, presenting that your data can be linked with other agencies' data and create something different and something might be valuable to any other agencies. So I think that's where the value is. Wow, that's, that's ambitious and impressive, actually. Uh, it would be great to see that, how that develops. In a similar uh, kind of direction, um, a question online, actually, for, for Fiji is, it, is really how does that play out in the environmental space and how do environmental and human health officers collaborate in Fiji for data preparedness? Well, within, within um, the Ministry of Health, and specifically within the Division of Health Protection, we have environmental health officers who are essentially health inspectors. So they are very heavily involved in um, water sanitation and hygiene, uh, pollution control, um, climate change, etc. So they really are our people on the ground when it comes to the interaction between health and the environment. At the same time, if you're looking at animal health, that is definitely an area where we um, have a bit, quite a bit of a gap. Um, similar to a lot of countries in the world, our animal health sector tends to be very under-resourced. Um, and for that reason, that is definitely a, a way that we can actually build up that, that area, is really paying attention to the animal health sector as well, well as the environmental health sector. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and just uh, out of interest, in the environmental health sector, is there uh, data environment also uh, undergoing an expansion, such as in the health, health uh, data space? They are building capacity in terms of laboratory capacity, PCR, um, and there's a lot more interaction in terms of the AMR, and under, the, under the umbrella of AMR, but there definitely needs to be more collaboration in order to give them the resources to build that capacity and collaborate better with the human health sector. And, and Stephen, uh, talking about capacity and going back to the issue of human capacity, 
you mentioned that uh, UKHSA is uh, looking to attract people uh, as a career destination in this space. You know, what are some of the opportunities and possibly some of the challenges that you're facing in what is clearly a highly competitive uh, market for, workforce market, um, trying to attract the types of skills that you need? And are there other approaches beyond simply recruiting staff that you're looking at to bring those skills into your, into your work? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the skills that we're looking for are in very high demand. Um, and we can't pay as much as other, other players in that marketplace. So I think many different similar agencies around the world are having the same struggles. And um, I think we do have a really interesting problem set. You know, I've, I've really enjoyed my career of being able to look at cool data, make some nice code, and generate insight about these systems. I think it, it is a nice, it's an attractive offer if you can't pay as much as you would like to. Um, and I think we have to partner as well. So you're right, we don't, want, we don't want to do all of the work. We want to facilitate it and work with partners. Um, and in the UK and around the world, we've got a lot of very talented um, academic partners and per partners in kind of commercial enterprises. So yeah, we'd aim to work with them as well. Great, Thank thanks very much. I think we're uh, heading towards the uh, kind of last part of the um, uh, discussion section. I think um, one of the big challenges we actually discussed today during the, the, the workshop with other thought leaders is around how to generate and sustain investment uh, for data preparedness and uh, data infrastructure or data architecture for uh, our national public health agencies in our, in our countries. Um, what type of uh, aspects do you think is important for us to communicate uh, in terms of those investments there's so many uh, workforce, technology, uh, technology infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. How can we clearly make that case uh, about where the investment is needed? Maybe we can start with Sangul. Um, maybe we should take the approach of quid pro quo. Um, um, recently, I had this um, opportunity to um, communicate with other colleagues in different parts of the world. And there was this unknown disease outbreak in Argentina, and there was respiratory outbreaks. Um, I think it was a couple months ago. And I wanted to have someone in Argentina so I can call up and ask what's going on. It doesn't have to be lab-conformed cases. I just want to know how the public health sector is responding. And I think you know, that need is not just me. I think everyone here has the same need when it comes to epidemic intelligence. And to be able to collaborate with other um, countries and uh, member states, I think we should have something to offer when we ask for something. So that's why quid pro quo is a good approach, valid. Um, I don't know how it's going to lay out, but that would be my answer. Great. Thanks. Alicia. For a country like Fiji, um Using the example of local ongoing problems, as I mentioned, our climate-sensitive diseases would help build the case, um, as well as, and I'm going to steal from Dr. Mike Ryan here, who he mentioned in last week's um, uh, consultation for national public health agencies about how investment in health emergency preparedness and response is an investment in stability. So that goes way beyond health. We don't need any more examples in the COVID-19 pandemic to see what an instability in public health does to the world. So using that example and um, showing how that investment in public health um, preparedness and response will actually benefit future generations, I think is important. But it still is a difficult case to make, particularly in economies that are recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. Great. Well. I, I can't argue with uh, quoting Dr. Mike Ryan, uh, always a good source of inspiration. Uh, Stephen? Yeah, I I'm probably saying similar things. I emphasize that it is an investment. I think there's, you know, and, it, and with an investment, you look for a return. Lots of organizations around the world have quite fragmented existing data systems. As we invest in more streamlined and efficient systems, we should genuinely improve the way we do business as usual, whatever that means in, in the different threats that we encounter. So there's, there's a return in the short term. And then, you know, following up some of the comments I made in the presentation, we have to reasonably expect 
significant emergencies in the next 10 or 20 years. And at that point, this investment pays again for the reasons you know, that have just been made, because we'll have better security and we'll reach, you know, we'll reach better decisions more quickly. So I think it emphasized the return because it is an investment. Great. Well, I'm going to ask a, a final question uh, to each of you and uh, uh, get a few uh, a reflection. It's a little bit of a, an adaptation of a, of a question asked online, um, but uh, and I'll give it my my slight uh, flavour as well. Uh, today, uh, we're still pretty much in the old paradigm where we're collecting information uh, and usually keeping it to ourselves, either different agencies within a country, different levels of our uh, administrative systems within our countries or between different uh, organizations. But in the, in the data preparedness conversation, we're talking about a much more evolved data ecosystem or de evolved data landscape where there's greater interconnectedness uh, of uh, information, greater collaboration uh, between each other. When do you think we'll get there? Oh, man. <laughs> so, um, I'll leave you a, a few seconds. Sang, will you, I, I think uh, you, you, we can start and go, th go along. Pretty soon, um, within, within a few years. Um, but I think it depends on how well we do um, build the trust between the countries bilaterally, multilaterally, and th that trust will sustain that kind of collaboration. So once we have that trust, it's, it's not a matter of time. It's just how much we're going to spend on that collaboration. Luckily, our commissioner, newly appointed commissioner, is very actively looking at the opportunity to work with other countries bilaterally and multilaterally. And um, we want to do that because not we want to brag about how successful we were during the COVID-19, but we recognize the need for collaboration to make sure that you know world is safe for working together. Great. Thank you so much, Alicia. Oh, I'll have to um, agree with Dr. Tech about that because trust is the key and trust goes both ways. The trust um, that a country will share, but also trust that when they do share, they will not be punished for sharing, which is, I think, absolutely critical because that is an incentive to share and it's an, also a disincentive not to share because particularly if you're coming from a vulnerable economy and the knowledge that if you share certain data that your economy will crash, I think that's a worry for any country and of course for developing countries. Great. So I, I can see that we're almost there, almost out of time. Stephen, final thoughts? Yeah, I, I think there are, we have to, there are two types of data. I think personally identifiable data that there's a whole different thing about how we share that, and that's a, that's a separate topic. I think there are really positive aspects of the pandemic on safe aggregate data, where a lot of the value is. So rapid sharing of completely safe aggregate data. I think we were there, we are there in some ways. If you think about the, you know, Twitter, in the UK, we had the Financial Times and many other data journalists from the session we did on data journalism that were on the analysis immediately getting insights as quickly as anyone else. So I think on, on the most important type of data, to some degree, we're, we're closer than we think. Great. Well, thank you very much to our panelists. Collaboration is the key. I think the, the future is almost now, uh, maybe tomorrow, uh, the tempting future of tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much to uh, our collaborators. Thank you very much. So thank you again to Oliver, Sengwu, Alicia, and Stephen for a really, really thoughtful conversation. Um, as many of the people in the room noted this morning in our data preparedness meeting, we don't actually have a common understanding and definition of what we need to be data prepared. And despite this, we've had a huge amount of enthusiasm and a large turnout, both for our technical discussions as well as for the event tonight. And I'm pretty certain this enthusiasm is extending beyond the food and the snacks that we are going to be offering right after this. Um, and since I'm still holding the microphone, just a couple of uh, final thoughts. Um, um, it was really clearly demonstrated that data preparedness cannot wait until the next emergency. Um, it needs to be built on knowledge learned from the previous crises. 
data preparedness also cannot be limited to national borders. We're all stakeholders in this work, and we all benefit from shared ownership, working in an environment of trust. And the requirements of data preparedness should not be defined just as what is needed today or tomorrow, but also looking ahead to the needs many years out. At WHO, we're helping to raise these important issues, foster collaboration, and harness the energy around it. But it's really the responsibility of everybody in this room, our, our colleagues online, and our colleagues globally, to work collectively to define the answers, to chart a way forward, and to bring solutions to scale. Uh, so, since I am now the only thing left between you and the social event, I'd like to sincerely thank you for joining us today. And on behalf of Chikwe and the amazing team here at the WHO Hub,、uh, we'd like to thank you for、um, for coming.、Um, we also want to invite you、um, back again in the future. Our next speaker series will be held here on June 13th, and we look forward to seeing you again then and continuing these really important discussions on complexity of pandemics. Thank you very much.